right now. Hello. I'm very happy this afternoon to introduce our seminar speaker, Professor Michael Walter of the University of Bristol. Professor Walter has a storied and very international academic career thus far, which began at the University of Nebraska, Omaha, where he obtained his Bachelor's of Science in Geology. He then moved on to obtain a B, uh, PhD at the University of Texas uh, at Dallas uh, in the same field. Some of you may recognize this face standing in front of us today. Because after he did his first postdoctoral fellowship in Alberta, Canada, he joined as a postdoctoral fellow at the Geophysical Laboratory for two years between 1993 and 1995. He then moved on to the Institute for the Study of the Earth's Interior at, in Misasa, Japan, where he worked his way up the ranks and became a full professor, and then was lured away to uh, the UK, so four countries now, um, where he is currently a professor at the University of Bristol and has been the head of school at the School of Earth Sciences since 2013. He is a fellow of the Mineral Mineralogical Society of America and the senior editor of the Journal of Geophysical Research. His broad research interests are reflected in the publication record where you can see his publications in varied journals ranging from Physical Review to the Astrophysical Journal. Please join me in welcoming Professor Michael Walter. Thanks a lot, Tim. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, all that moving around has created a very difficult tax situation at times, let me tell you. Um, it's almost tax day as well, isn't it? Yeah, I better get my act together. So today, um, I'm going to talk to you about some, actually some very new results. Um, quite exciting for me because they're experiments that I actually did myself, um, which is uh, in the last few years been something of a rarity. Um, and it's what I'm going to be talking to you about is water in the lower mantle and where it might be stored specifically. And I just show this P-wave tomography image where you can kind of turn the contrast on and see a subduction slab that looks a bit like a fire hose squirting water into the lower mantle. Um, now, I think nothing could be further from the truth, and we'll, we'll get there by the end of, of, of the talk. This, um, just a little bit of background about this project, it's part of a larger NERC, uh, this is the Research Council in Britain that uh, most of the geological sciences are funded through, a larger project that was funded, um, a consortium project involving uh, three hubs, and Bristol is one of the hubs. Um, called Volatiles, Geodynamics, and Solid Earth Controls on the Habitable Planet. This is a, uh, an 8 million pound consortium, and our particular Bristol hub um, is running a whole range of projects. And it took me a little while to figure out which one of these projects I wanted to talk about. Most of them are kind of half-baked, um, including the one I'm going to discuss today. Um, you can get an idea, these projects range from the origin of volatiles in the planet um, on, the, on the Earth and in the Moon. Uh, what we'll be talking about today is uh, part, of a, part of a project related to understanding the phase equilibrium, uh, what phases might hold water and how much in both the deep mantle and the core. Um, volatiles uh, solution in a magma ocean, uh, deep mantle structure and the effect on geodynamics, and as well uh, a series of PhD fellowships related to diamond and the deep volatile cycle. So it kind of starts here, and what we really want to get at is an understanding of how much water could be in the lower mantle, and then maybe make some predictions about how much is there. Obviously, it's a very big reservoir. There's a couple of ways it could be there. One, it could be primordial water. Very difficult to know how much water might be stored in some deep mantle reservoir. Now, a, a, an early magma ocean was probably very efficient at outgassing any original magma ocean water, as long as that entire magma ocean um, was, was molten, the entire silicate portion of the earth, earth was molten. There are some indications from uh, rare gases, um, short-lived isotopic systems as well, for um, possibly long-lived, early formed reservoirs 
um, that could contain some amount of, of volatile elements as well. Very difficult to put numbers on, on that. Perhaps the main way that you would get water back into the deep mantle is through, is through recycling and through subduction. Um, this is a diagram uh, published oh, 10 years ago now by, by Mark Hirschman, Hirschman kind of giving you an idea of the different um, s the pathways for water in the deep mantle, and particularly the red regions are where water might induce melting uh, in the mantle. So it kind of goes down at subduction, and we're, we're interested to see how much can we get down here, and if it, if it is there, what is the capacity for storage in the nominally anhydrous minerals that make up that, that massive lower mantle reservoir? And you kind of see this over here on the right, where the upper mantle storage capacity increases due to the increased solubility in olivine, primarily with, with depth, and then the transition zone, which can contain copious amounts of water in wadsleyite and ringwoodite, perhaps up to two or three oceans worth if it was um, at its storage capacity. And the lower mantle, this tiny little sliver, um, as the sort of um, knowledge that we have to date is that the minerals in the lower mantle probably don't take much water. What I'm going to show you is that there's a lot of uncertainty in that, and we wanted to take a new look at this problem. Um, and eventually, with the aim of trying to understand if there is water in, especially the main perovskite minerals that make up uh, the lower mantle, what the effects ultimately might be on, on things like mantle rheology um, as part of our longer-term goal of, of the project. So. Recycling at subduction zones is a very efficient way to remove water from downgoing slabs. So you have water in hydrous minerals as part of the basaltic crust at the top of the downgoing slab. You also have water held um, in minerals in the ultramafic and gabbroic part of the, of the lithospheric slab. And you see this is some this classic work by Pauline Schmidt over the years, which has showed the, the, the continuous reactions that occur and the dehydration that reactions that remove water from the slab. And that results in, in a hydrated mantle wedge, inducing partial melting in the origin of arc volcanoes. And primary arc magmas probably have around 4 weight percent water. And so it's a pretty efficient way to remove water from the slab. However, especially in the deeper portions of the slab, there are pressure temperature paths which allow you to keep a hydrous phase stable to the deeper mantle. Particularly, you have to go from uh, serpentine breakdown and tigerite breakdown to 10 angstrom phase and into phase A, and then a continuous series of dense hydrosilicate phases, and potentially um, water all the way into, into the lower mantle, as we'll see. Peter will recognize the Subway Tokyo map diagram. And this was a, um, a study which was trying to determine exactly what the efficiency of recycling will be as long as you know something about the thermal structure of the slab. And this is a compendium of all the thermal structures of all the um, extant modern subduction zones. Um, and the estimate for the amount of H2O loss from those um, subducting slabs using constraints from phase equilibria. And it ranges from highly efficient um, uh, dewatering to, in the coldest slabs, incomplete removal of the water. Now, Peter and his colleagues made some estimates of, on the basis of extrapolating this kind of subduction regime back through geologic history and estimated that perhaps over the age of the Earth, Subduction may have increased the water content of the mantle by something like 400 ppm. Uh, doesn't seem like a lot, but that is enough um, to, especially if it ends up in the lower mantle, to change considerably the dynamics of, of that region. Also, there's, a con you know, there's uncertainty on these numbers, and there's also primordial water to consider uh, as well. But that provides sort of a backdrop um, for what we think the um, recycling, at how, uh, how recycling at subduction zone works. Now, if you do make it into the deeper mantle, here's a phase diagram from, from Nishi et al. showing, uh, again, this is for pyrolite or a peridotitic mantle plus H2O. And you go from antigorite. If you're on a slab geotherm, which is sufficiently cold, again, you can, you can make it from antigorite to phase A. Then you have wadsleyite and ringwoodite, which, which have a very high storage capacity for water, up to two weight percent or so. 
Um, and then you go through a series of, of dense hydrous silicates, phase D, superhydrous phase B, eventually this new phase H. Um, and I'll show you some experiments which show that this phase H, um, MgSiO4H2, can, when you add alumina, go all the way to the core mantle boundary. So this is the kind of path that we're interested in in terms of um, recycling water into the lower mantle. Sediment, sediment will, will predominantly dehydrate in, in the shallow subduction region because right? it's at that slab mantle interfer, interface and, and gets hot. Terry Plank has estimated that, that virtually zero water comes from sediment past the, past the subduction phase. So what we're interested in today, though, is, and the results I'm going to show you are really around understanding how much water you can store in the anomaly anhydrous minerals in the lower mantle. So here, just to remind you, a couple of phase diagrams. This is for pritatite. This is for a mafic or a meta, a meta basalt composition. Um, these are some uh, diagrams from Ben Hart's paper in 2010. And in the lower mantle in a pritatite, you have predominantly, you're dominated by perovskite structured minerals, magnesium perovskite or, or bridgmanite. Um, and calcium perovskite with a bit of an oxide, magnesium ion oxide ferropericlase. Whereas in a meta basalt, again, you're dominated by perovskite minerals, but you have stichovite um, as well as a couple of uh, luminous phases, calcium ferrite phase and, and sodium, uh, or new aluminous phase. We're interested again today in, in looking at the water capacity of these, of these major minerals in the lower mantle, the, the perovskite structured phases. So how wet is the transition zone? What do we know about that region where we know that the water storage capacity um, is very high? Um, so shown here is some direct, um, or at least you know, I guess it's more indirect data for the, the capacity of, or, or the actual water content of, of the transition zone. This is log conductivity on the y-axis versus depth. And what these authors did, uh, Yoshino et al., was to measure the electrical conductivity experimentally um, in both Wadsleyite and Ringwoodite, and then compare it to estimates on the basis of measured conductivity values for the, for the transition zone. Um, and what they found, and so here are some different um, conductivity profiles. Maybe look at the Pacific here. It's perhaps the best one. What they found is that in their estimate, the transition zone is relatively dry. Um, perhaps containing up to 1,000 ppm or so water. This is not too dissimilar to the results of Zhu et al., who also estimated of the order 2,000 ppm in the transition zone, which is well undersaturated relative to its storage capacity of uh, perhaps, perhaps a weight percent and a half. Okay, so that's one indication that although it can contain a lot of water, uh, it might not. If, there were, if we were looking for water in the deep mantle, the transition zone might be where we expect to find it. <laughs> However, and many of you will recognize Graham Pearson, um, Graham discovered, along with his co-workers, as an inclusion in a diamond from Brazil, um, an inclusion of ringwoodite. This isn't the inclusion. This is a synthetic uh, ringwoodite. Um, the ringwoodite is actually in there somewhere. Um, and it's lost now, I believe, forever. Um, but they were able to analyze it, determine that indeed it was ringwoodite through both Raman and X-ray spectroscopy, and measure the water content through um, FTIR, and they measured about, about a weight percent. So at least in this particular case, um, and these, these inclusions, everything we know, and I gave a talk here about six months ago, and perhaps some of you remember, probably not, most of those inclusions show a lot of indication for recycling that they, that they form from recycled fluids, recycled fluids and melts. Um, so it's very likely that these diamonds are, are forming from metasomatic agents, you will, if you will, in the transition zone. And so the diamond and the inclusions within them probably reflect something about the nature of those fluids rather than the ambient mantle. Be that as it may, what it means is there is recycling of water to at least the depth of the transition zone. Now, we've been involved in a study with, with colleagues at DTM to do the same thing. And we have measured the water content in a number of silicate inclusions in diamond from Juina. Uh, this is an example of uh, NanoSIMS 
mapping. If you want to know the details of how this is converted to actual numbers, I point you to Eric there in nearly the front row. Um, and what we found, we looked at a whole range of inclusions, and what we found was a, a wide range of, of water contents. And here's a, here's a table that shows some of those, and I'll point out some. And, and, and the water contents range over, over you know, significant amounts. But when you compare these to known solubilities in these minerals, for the most part, they are all undersaturated as far as we can tell, meaning that the water activity in the fluids or melts from which the diamond crystallize, crystallized was, was less than one. Um, if I point, we're, today we're interested in perovskites. Um, and here's an example of the kinds of inclusions that we find. Some of them are nearly pure calcium silicate perovskite. Most of them are a solid solution between CaSiO3 perovskite and CaTiO3 perovskite, and they show evidence of unmixing on uplift. So we analyzed a series of these kinds of inclusions and have a wide range of water content. Here's one that has, uh, one of them is in the CaSiO3 rich portion, the other in the titanium rich portion, but that's uh, a lot of water, 3938, about 0 0.3, 0 0.4 weight percent. If you add that up, it looks like a couple of thousand ppm uh, in the calcium perovskite. So that indicates that, that these perovskites can, that they have a high capacity to store water and they may be a, um, an agent for transfer into the deeper mantle and um, also an agent of, uh, to, to store water in the deep mantle. Okay, so what do we know about storage capacity in perovskites uh, or bridgmanite in the lower mantle? So this is quite an interesting slide, I think, that I put together on the airplane over, just trying to make sense of all of the previous studies for bridgmanite, uh, the, main, the main mineral in the lower mantle, so H2O on this axis and PPM, um, and all of these studies over here, and you see quite an astonishing range. I have always been partial to the original work by Bolfon Casanova et al. This is from the 03 paper, but she originally published uh, beginning of that work in 2000, um, where she found that in MGSIO3 perovskite originally, less than 10 ppm water, and that's by FTIR. These are color-coded to the technique used to determine the water um, in these experiments. So these are experimental results, except for the purple ones, which are ab initio calculations. And you see all the experiments which are using um, equilibrating in, in the multi-amble, bridgmanite with, with um, a lot of water, typically five to 10 weight percent water. There's quite a range of compositions. Litisov et al. Um, found a much broader range, looking at compositions ranging from in-member MgSO3 to some with some alumina content, some with some iron contents, um, and, and produced this range all the way up to almost 2,000 ppm water. Now, if there's that much water in storage capacity in, in Bridgmanite, then the storage capacity in the lower mantle is of the order 1,500 ppm or so, a bit more, and you can store oceans, many oceans worth um, of water there. Um, anyway, et al. also did experiments in 2010 and found numbers between about 300 and 700 ppm, measured by SIMS. Um, similarly, Murakami et al. also doing experiments in the multiamble and measuring by both SIMS and FTIR found uh, the highest amounts of, of around 2,000 ppm. So these are big differences. And the view that I've always had, and, and others, I think, is that it's easy to find ways to overestimate the amount of water because of the potential for other phases, small degree partial melts or other hydrous phases that, that um, are crystallizing in the experiments. But it's very difficult to figure out a way that you don't put water in uh, an experiment. These experiments that Bolfon Casanova et al. were equilibrated with ringwoodites that had several thousand, that had more than two weight percent water in them. Okay, so they didn't lose water from those experimental charges. The ab initio results also give a bit of a confounding picture. Um, in the work by Hernandez et al., what they did was to look at the partitioning to calculate the enthalpies of formation of various defects in the Bridgmanite structure between ringwoodite and magnesium perovskite and calculate a partition coefficient between those. They don't calculate solubilities, but they calculate partitioning. And then knowing at a given set of conditions how much uh, water ringwoodite can take, you can estimate, therefore, how much the perovskite can take. And they estimated something like 
1,000 ppm, and that's for vacancy uh, magnesium and silica vacancy substitution mechanisms. Panera et al. did something similar, um, tried to calculate direct solubilities in those calculations, and also did some experiments and found a number more around, um, uh, she estimated a, a maximum of about 220 ppm, but I think as, I, as I've talked to Wendy, that her expectation is that that's a maximum and, and, and she really feels it's probably less than 100 ppm. Now here's a, a name from the past that you might re re recollect here at the geophysical lab, Charlie Mead. Charlie was here when, when I was here. Um, and he did these experiments back in 1994 and he came up with a value uh, using FTR of about two or 300 ppm. And uh, I don't know, he might have been right and we kind of have been wasting time for the last 22 years. But there's a lot of uncertainty here, especially with the round um, the, the type of substitution mechanism that might yield uh, more solubility, especially if it's coupled to, say, uh, alumina uh, substitution. So, a few years ago, we did some experiments in the system MGO SiO2 Al2O3H2O, where we're interested in mapping out the phase relations for hydrous compositions in, in this system. And so I want to. Um, identify the players here. So this is Bridgmanite, corundum over here. There's a phase, this phase called phase H, which is a magnesium silica, a hydrated magnesium silicate. Um, and there's a, there's a complete solid solution, it turns out, between that phase and this delta ALOOH phase. Um, there's also another hydrous silicate phase that, that appears in these experiments called phase D, and this is also a solid solution and, and, and can have um, a very high alumina content. So I won't go over the details. I actually talked a little bit about this back in October as well. But what we did is a series of experiments in the diamond anvil cell, um, looked at uh, diffraction of, of the run products to determine the phase boundaries in the system. And these all have um, about uh, between 5 and 10 mole percent Al2O3 and about 5 mole percent water. So there, there's quite a bit of water in them. And you can see as we go to higher and higher pressure that we have this series of changes in the phase uh, in the phase equilibria. Here we have phase D in equilibrium with stichovite. Then we produce phase H. Um, phase D begins to go, go away. We have perovskite in phase H, and eventually we have uh, just perovskite and stichovite and no um, hydrous phase at all. This is, in the, this is in the alumina free system. Now when you add alumina, things change a lot because of the solubility of alumina in the, in the phase H, which stabilizes it to much higher pressures. And so I'm not going to go through all this data in detail, but just show you the final phase diagram. This is in the MASH system, so the alumina bearing system, temperature and pressure. And what you find is that phase D is out about 50 GPA, and phase H is stable all the way to the core mantle boundary. So this is a way to, to have a phase in a, along a cold subduction geotherm, which might come up here about, about in here somewhere, um, and provide a mechanism for transport of water into the, into the deeper portions of, of the mantle. Now it turns out that at mantle temperatures along a mantle adiabat, we also determine the melting curve uh, in this system. And the mantle adiabat runs very close to that melting curve. I think if you add other components to it, the expectation would be that along a mantle adiabat in the lower mantle, the stable phase for hydrogen would be a partial melt, a hydrous partial melt. Okay, so you kind of need this cold slab geotherm to, to produce or, or to um, um, to deliver the water to the deep mantle. Then if it heats up to ambient conditions, you'd end up with a partial melt. Now, one of the things that we noticed in these experiments, when we plotted the ambient unit cell volume of the Bridgmanite phase as a function of its synthesis pressure, we noticed this, this change from when phase D is in equilibrium with it, it's very close to the MGSIO3 value, you add alumina to Bridgmanite, and it inflates the ambient cell volume a bit. Okay, and so there's some, and so what we thought was this: this must reflect partitioning of alumina between between these phases. And as you go to higher and higher pressures, that the the partitioning must be changing. But the slope of this is unusually high, higher than we would have predicted um, from our understanding of the incorporation of alumina by a charge coupled substitution, uh, alumina to alumina for magnesium and silica in the perovskite structure. So we got to thinking that, that maybe this is something else. So uh, just to kind of give you an idea of the partitioning, um, 
as you go to higher, as you increase pressure, it may be that at lower pressures, the, the bridgmanite has low alumina and the phase H has high alumina. And as you move to higher pressure, that three-phase triangle sweeps through the diagram um, so that you have higher alumina in bridgmanite and lower alumina in, in phase H. Yes? Oh, yes, sorry. These are all experiments done in the laser-heated diamond ample cell. Um, and so we simply synthesize the experiments for typically around a half hour. Um, and, then, and then measured by diffraction at a synchrotron um, what the stable phase assemblage w assemblages were. Okay. Yeah. Those are all synthesis points. Yeah. No, this is decompressed. Okay, so these are ambient cell volumes as a function of the synthesis pressure. So this is the pressure we synthesize them at, but these are ambient cell volumes. That way we're comparing things uh, at, at the same place. Otherwise, we'd have to have an equation of state for every different composition. Yeah, platinum is the absorber. Yeah. Now, it's possible that you can make a platinum hydride. Normally, we, we looked for that, and we didn't see any clear evidence for it in nearly all experiments. There were a few experiments that had unusual shifts in the platinum peak that might have been, um, been platinum hydride. Platinum black. Okay, so I got to talking with colleagues at, um, so the bottom line is that this, this increase in cell volume, which is very systematic, um, seems to um, be difficult to explain by luminous substitution alone. And so we thought, well, maybe this represents a coupled substitution involving alumina and hydrogen. Okay, so I got to talking to colleagues at, at um, UCL, John Broadholt and um, his postdoc called Joshua Muir. And um, we got to thinking about what the substitution mechanisms would be. And so again, this is a, this is a, a tetrahedron alumina is away from you. This, this would be the charge coupled substitution um, just for straight alumina, Al2O3. This is going towards a Brown-Millerite substitution where you have a vacancy formation as shown here. You end up with an oxygen vacancy. And it's long been thought that this is a good way to potentially hydrate the perovskite through those vacancies uh, on that oxygen vacancy. Um, however, in our, ex our previous studies in the Illumina system where we, where we worked along that join, this is a paper we published in 2006, as well as, as um, ab initio calculation from John Broadhold's group, this particular substitution mecha mechanism is unlikely to be important above about 40 GPA. Okay? It's, it's just energetically unfavorable, perhaps at the upper part of the lower mantle um, but not certainly at higher pressures. So we were interested in this particular substitution here, where you have an alumina and a hydrogen substituting for, for a silica in the structure. And so what we wanted to do in this, in this set of experiments I'm going to show you is move directly along that compositional join and, and see what um, the change in volume is. Now first what we had is the is Josh and, and John calculated from ab initio, this, I should take the MD off there because it's at zero Kelvin, um, calculate the expected change in the ambient cell volume um, as a function of substitution of AL and H relative to the expected substitution for the charge coupled substitution involving AL and AL without hydrogen. And that's a pretty big change. And once, once they did that calculation, we decided that's something that we can, we can definitely measure. We, we, have, we have the precision to measure that by x-ray diffraction. And so we have something we can test here. If we're moving directly along that join, we should see that kind of change um, in unit cell volume. So what we did was we synthesized um, bulk compositions along that join. This is the alumina over alumina plus silica ratio in the compositions that we chose as a function of H2O content. We made glasses of the appropriate stoichiometry with the magnesium and the alumina without hydrogen. And then we added hydrogen as gold hydroxide. Now, we did this because we, we didn't want to add it as brucite because that becomes part of the phase equilibrium. You might not, you might not break it down completely. We didn't want to have this potential for a problem in our experiments and have partitioning amongst the brucite. We wanted to add water into something where we could control very precisely the amount of water we were putting in, 
um, by breaking down that component. And gold hydroxide is very unstable. It breaks down at room temperature or at ambient conditions at around 150 degrees Celsius to gold oxide. And gold oxide is also very unstable and breaks down at, at, at uh, maybe 180 or 190 degrees Celsius. And of course, these are at pressure. But the idea is that we break the gold hydroxide down. And eventually, we get to metallic gold, water, and some excess oxygen, which at least in this case, since we're in an iron free system, um, doesn't really bother us. So that was the idea. And these are the four bulk compositions that we made, a dry one and, and three with varying amounts of water content. And the idea then is, can we see a change in the ambient unit cell volume? Um, and when, it, when perovskite becomes saturated, if you can see that change, you should see it plateau in terms of its cell volume. That was the, that was the idea behind, behind the experiment. So we did laser heating. All of the experiments I'm going to show you were done between about 55 and 75 GPA. And we kept, kept them at one constant temperature. They were all done at about 1,800 uh, Kelvin. So we took them to the synchrotron, measured the unit cell volumes. Here's some examples of the diffraction patterns where we have perovskite peaks here. Um, these are the two hydrous compositions. And um, indeed, we do see phase H coming in quite quickly. That's another indication that you've already saturated. You're making phase H. Um, there's a little bit of a, of a nub in here, but it doesn't quite match up with phase H. It looks like we might be seeing something. The new peak here that I don't know what it is yet. Um, we also have clearly gold. And, and so gold was the absorber in these experiments. Once you break it down, you hit it with the laser, it breaks down immediately, um, releases the water, and, and produces gold and, and excess water. So there's gold in the diffraction pattern. And then in the, uh, in the dry one, it was, it was platinum black. And those of you who are used to looking at, at uh, diffraction patterns will notice that, that you can't have, there's no detectable shift in any of those, of those patterns. And this is the result that we find, which is basically nothing, OK? Um, so virtually all of these are indistinguishably, indistinguishable within um, within uh, measurement uncertainty. Surprisingly, we don't even really see a lumina substitution um, as well. And that may indicate that uh, at these conditions, at these pressures, we're making phase H immediately when we saturate and there's partitioning of alumina into that phase. Okay, so, um, so they're saturated. If we say, well, let's take the average of these points, um, then the, you know, there might be a little shift here. It's statistically um, not, not, um, not valid. But we could place maybe a maximum water content of 150 ppm or so. But I would say that it is probably less than that. Um, and this, I think, confirms previous experimental and theoretical results indicating very low solubility in bridge bonite. Okay. So that was, yes. We, th these are literally two weeks old. So, yep. I, I was, I was. <laughs> I was um, reducing the diffraction patterns on the airplane. Um, and, and so it was, it was a little bit disappointing you know, um, to, have that, uh, to have that happen. But, but um, I think it's, 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 a very, it's a very solid result. And the next thing to do is to actually take bib sections of these and see if we can make, make direct measurements, at least of the, the phase equilibria. So <coughs> we also did this with calcium perovskite. And the experiments that I'm going to talk to you about today were actually part of a senior thesis. So this is a fourth year undergraduate student who was taken to experiments like a duck on a pond. And he did really a remarkable job. Um, did all the, all the laser heating experiments um, himself, created all the, um, the, um, the glasses. And so what we did was we wanted to work um, First of all, it's very difficult to work with calcium silicate perovskite because it doesn't, it doesn't quench. It, quench it, it goes amorphous upon quench. And if you want to, say, um, use this technique of looking at the cell volumes to, um, to determine when you go to saturation, then doing that at high pressure is very difficult because you have the problem. You'd have to be exactly at, at, at you have the problem of, of dealing with different equations of, of state. So what we did was is we worked in two compositions. One, the CATIO3 in member, where we first synthesized crystalline um, perovskite at, at one atmosphere in this system. And then we made a glass of, of a silica-rich solid solution 
um, calcium with, with about 65% silica and 35% titanium uh, in the structure. Um, and these glasses were synthesized at one atm atmosphere at about 1,700 degrees. That's about the, the most silica that you could put in and still quench to a calcium, uh, a stable calcium perovskite phase. Uh, water, again, was added as gold hydroxide in uh, the amounts of 1, 3, 5, and 10,000 ppm. And all the experiments were done at 50, G 50 GPA and about 1,900 K. And again, we took diffraction on PT quench samples. Oops. And this is what Ben found. And I told Ben, <laughs> it never works like this, right? This is the first experiments he's ever done in his life. <laughs> and they come and they fall in this beautiful line. Um, and I, this, is, this is quite extraordinary to me. Um, and so what this would say is that um, as we move up in the, in the bulk water content in, in the starting composition, uh, we, we're undersaturated with water here. And this is the saturation point when we go to this plateau. This is what we were hoping to, to be able to see in the Bridgmanite as well. And when you extrapolate um, that down to um, this axis, we would predict around 5,200 ppm, or half a weight percent water um, soluble in the calcium titanium in member of, of this, um, this solid solution. So that's a lot of water. Now, we did the same thing with this um, calcium. Actually, that's wrong. That should be calcium silica 65 titanium 35. Sorry about that. And what we found initially, when, when, when Ben sent me the results, um, he said, well, this looks different. This looks like it's plateauing out very quickly, and the water solubility is very low, which I thought was, was quite unusual um, for that composition. Then a day later, he emails me and says, Mike, I think we have another perovskite phase in these diffraction patterns. And it um, turns out that he did. And this one was, uh, looked like this. Okay. And so you might say, well, that's a bit of a mess. Here in the background is what we found for calcium uh, for the titanium in member. And clearly, we have this change. And then maybe it flattens off. But the interesting thing is we see one phase, single phase perovskite in the dry system. We see two perovskites at 1,000, 3,000, and 5,000 ppm water. And then we're back to one perovskite at 10,000 ppm water. Okay. So how is that explicable? So we end up with, with something like this. We have the single phase region here, which I would predict based on the unit cell volumes that this is a calcium silica rich perovskite phase. Then we unmix into two phases, one a silica-rich phase, one a titanium-rich phase. Um, we have two, two perovskites in this region, and then we go back to, to a single-phase perovskite at higher water content. Yeah. No, that's a very good point. And in fact, I should, I should point out that at the condition, at the synthesis conditions, at least in the dry system, for what we know, we chose synthesis conditions where we should make a cubic perovskite at high pressure and temperature. Uh, but that's a displacive transition when it goes back to, to ambient conditions. And what we did find is that, sure enough, we can see the orthorhombic symmetry through super lattice peaks that develop. Uh, we don't see a lot of sp peak splitting, but we see peak broadening. Um, on some of the on some of the peaks, and then and then, then again we have these small super lattice um, peaks. Now in these diffraction patterns, like I don't have one to show you, they are completely distinct. They are, they are so far away from each other that um, it's clear that there's two phases. And we can we can we've done GSAS on these, and he's able to he's able to do the full spectrum for both of them. Yeah. Oh, no, we don't know what their compositions are, OK? Absolutely. That's the next slide, Ben. Um, yes. So the next slide is, so, so, which is which, so, so phase point is that since we don't know the compositions of these anymore, because they're solid solutions, some were intermediate, we can no longer use this technique to say it's saturated, which is why we have uh, this unusual places where they're saturated, OK? so. Um, I've just made one attempt 
in my hotel room yesterday to draw a sort of sensible phase diagram um, for this system at, these, at this particular pressure and temperature conditions. And it would have to look something like this, where we have a single perovskite solid solution. Now we know we've got about 5,000 ppm solubility in the CATAO3 in member phase. I'll tell you, if you keep it a secret, that, that uh, my colleague Andrew Thompson from UCL has done a series of very clever experiments in a multi-anvil where he has used uh, a calcium silicate in member, CESIO3, plus various amounts of water up to using one, two, three, five, and 10 weight percent water. And then when he quenches those from the multi-anvil, he slices and dices and measures very accurately with, with SEM and imaging techniques what the mode is of, those, uh, of the calcium silicate perovskite phase he quenches and a hydrous calcium silicate phase um, that, that he quenches as well. Okay, So it's saturated in water. And what he finds is that the mode changes systematically. And when he extrapolates that back to um, zero um, excess water phase, this other calcium bearing hydrous phase, back to zero in the mode, he ends up with 4,000 ppm uh, water in, in the calcium silicate perovskite. So it's a very interesting way to do it. I've actually not seen the data, just had it explained to me. Um, but at least it gives me some anchor point over here, which is very similar to what we predict for the, for the calcium titanium rich phase. So the Phase diagram, which, which, may, which may work, has, has some shape like this. We have a single phase. So here's the bulk composition. We have a single phase here. By 1,000 ppm, we've got two phases, a calcium silica phase and a calcium titanium phase. Um, the two-phase region, the miscibility gap is here. And then we have to go back to a perovskite plus must be some fluid or melt phase in, in this region. So that's quite interesting. And what Faye was getting at is, is, is that once you are on this, um, on this um, solvus here, that um, you're going to have different, different unit cell volumes as a function of, of the composition. Now, what's interesting, if you remember, for the calcium silica rich phase, the one with the lower volume, it kind of went up and plateaued very quickly, which I thought was quite unusual. But that might happen because as you move this way along the solvus, your volume is decreasing. But as you're putting more water in that phase, your volume is increasing. And so there's this trade-off between the two, which could lead to a relatively constant volume. Um, so that is where I, that's where we're at right now. Um, we are going to continue on with this study. But if we simply take those results and we make some estimate of the water solubility in uh, the lower mantle, the water capacity, what we'd say for lower mantle pritotite would be about 400 ppm, which is a remarkably coincident result and has nothing to do with Peter's results, but it's kind of the same numbers, right? <laughs> Basically, it may be that we've exactly filled the lower mantle with water, okay? The bathtub is full. Um, and that, that if you do the same thing for a sort of a metabasalt in the lower mantle, um, because of the high solubility of the calcium perovskite, that you could have perhaps as much as 1500 ppm um, water store to storage capacity in that basaltic portion. However, the basalt part of the slab is the part which is most difficult to get any water past, past the subduction zone. So I would argue that that's an unlikely carrier. Um, the rest of these is what I've already said. Water solubility in luminous bridgenite is less than approximately 150 ppm. In calcium titanium is around 5,000. And we have discovered this two-phase field that is going to require a lot more work um, to, un to decipher. And I'll leave it right there, and I'm happy to answer any questions. So, uh, yeah. I have a question to ask. Yeah. Okay. Right. I, you know, I meant to. Yes. No, I meant to say that from the beginning that when I say water, what I really mean is hydrogen in some form. Okay which I actually changed my title, you might notice, from um, the original title so that I, uh, that I call it now. It's a backward version of the entire talk. Um, hey, Graham. Um, investigations into hydrogen. 
in the lower mantle. So there's your there's your semantic problem. Okay, a uh, technically <coughs> question: uh, Do you use a pressure medium? In these experiments, I chose not to, and the reason I did that was because I didn't want any ac interaction with the pressure medium. Okay. Well, actually, what I do is I use a thin foil of the composition itself as the pressure medium. Yep. So there's a slight region there where where there's no absorber in it. Okay, fair right. enough. Yeah. Why don't you use water itself? Uh, instead of uh, using uh, gold hydrate? Well, simply because it's, it's, it's difficult to precise. This, this is a really good way to precisely put the stoichiometric amount of water in. Um, and at the same time, you get your absorber. Now, what I would say for those of you who are interested in, in, in the laser heating aspect of this is that these things heat beautifully. And part of that, I think, is because the gold hydroxide is really, really fine. It comes as basically a nanopowder, and it mixes really beautifully in with when, when you grind it, unlike gold. Gold is notoriously difficult to mix because it's malleable. It flattens out. It clumps. It, 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 it's hard to get it to the point where you get really uniform heating. Uh, this is much more uniform heating than you get with platinum black as well. So it's very, very pleased by it. Yes. It, yes, it, it is a problem. I, d I don't know what happens to the oxygen, right? I, my, my assumption is that it goes off and reacts with the diamond. But, but it's, it's a very good point. We've got this ex ex excess oxygen, um, and, and I don't know. I, I haven't seen any evidence for peroxide. Yeah, it might be something, but yeah, it's a good point. Yeah, I just wonder um, when you uh, do the, uh, w when you say the face edge goes to the lower mantle, it might get. Well, it, it, got, it might exceed the melting temperature. Uh, the geothermal might get too hot. So I just wonder, you know, the melt might be denser. It might not. Like this I actually, just wonder, this yeah. actually is one of the reasons that we were looking in this system in the lower mantle. Ultimately, part of that bigger project we have is to understand. Because my view is that in the lower mantle, the the, the, the stable phase, the stable hydrogen bearing phase, is going to be melt. And what you want to know is where that goes. And so what we are aiming for is to understand if the composition of those melts and then to develop techniques to do synchrotron PDF on those melts to see if we can measure their densities and, and discover whether they're going to move up, whether they're going to move down. And another aspect of that proposal is to look at the wetting angles to see um, whether or not, you know, you know what kind – how they might migrate or not, and how they might get trapped on grain boundaries to see if we can discover whether or not in the lower mantle they might have a seismic signature. Because it doesn't take much alignment of a low degree melt to produce an anisotropic, uh, a measurable seismic system in terms of uh, anisotropy. Uh, what is the solubility of water in calcium titanium perovskite at ambient pressure? Um, we don't know that. Right. Actually, you know, we don't know that. And so what we have done is we've synthesized a, a, a – we've done an experiment at one GPA in the piston cylinder, wet and grown relatively large grains, and uh, the next part of Ben's project, well, it's due in two weeks, I'm not sure we'll get there, um, is to do FTIR on those samples, right, and perhaps, perhaps sim. But we've already noticed with the Raman that we have in, we, we've created inclusions, micro-inclusions in those samples. It's really hard to get rid of those when you have a lot of water in the system. Yeah, Mike, um, really, really nice study. Uh, for the lower mantle uh, stability, what you're discussing, right, is, is the storage capacity of the anomaly anhydrous yeah. side of things. Uh, so this doesn't, nec doesn't necessarily preclude uh, adding uh, more water in the form of a hydrous phase, right? No. no. And my point there would be that you can do that with phase H. There is a pathway to get all the way from the slab through antigorite, through phase A, through superhydrous D, through D, to H on a cold subduction geotherm that can take you all the way to the core mantle boundary. As soon as that heats up, it's going to produce a partial melt. Uh, Mike, what is the difference? Well, what is the crystallographic reason for uh, such a drastic behavior, such a divergent behavior of um, bridgmanite and calcium perovskite in terms of water in incorporation? Well, in terms of the bridgmanite, I can tell you that I've seen at least the, the model that Josh has developed for the substitution, and the hydrogen is sort of 
on the edge of the of the octahedra. That's the that's the that's the minimum energy configuration, and he predicted um, uh, again about a 0.15 percent change over 10 percent, 10 mole percent Al2 or 3. I don't know exactly why it's so large relative, and I've asked him that question and haven't got a real answer. It's just that's what it is when I do the calculation. Um, the, the amount that we see changing in calcium titanium perovskite is unusual, and it's about five times larger than Josh predicts it should be for either calcium vacancy substitution mechanism or titanium vacancy substitution mechanism. So we don't know the answer to your question, why the inflation of the structure um, should be so large. Now, something that has worried me about, about Ben's results is that if you look at published values for the ambient condition volume of CATIO3 perovskite, it's very close to our values for the wet ones. But then when you go look at the synthesis conditions, they all added water to the runs to help um, synthesize the perovskite. So I think we don't know what the ambient condition um, cell volume is very well, even for CATIO3. Nice way to kind of survey the uh, composition uh, as a as a hydrogen content as a as a uh, function of uh, unicell, but it's ultimately going to limit it what resolution you can see because unicell is not going to be that sensitive, right? And uh, I assume you're following up with those uh, measurements. The other uh, uh, point is really you have no composition control uh, without. Uh, look at the recovery example. For example, your bridgmanite, and uh, I can speculate. You know, those trends could be due to the magnesium saturations or defects. For example, created that rather than hydrogen substitutions. So you really need to right. know the composition you, of you, that. You, you do, and of course, in the diamond anvil cell, when you're when you're using such amount of small material, you do have this issue of whether or not what you're putting in is what you what you think you're what you think you're putting in. I would say that the reason that we designed the study to move directly along that compositional vector was exactly what you're talking about. We didn't want to be off composition in such a way that we were dealing with either uh, you know, um, silica vacancies or magnesium vacancies or some other vacancy formation mechanism. Another good reason why we tried to add the water very precisely. So we made glasses with, you know, we made a, you know, a gram of glass so that we could be quite precise in, in the, the correct stoichiometry of magnesium and silica. Um, and then we were able to add water to that quite precisely with, with by adding aerosol hydroxide. Now, of course, you have to grind all that up and you have to, you know, you're using a very small amount. What we can say is that we didn't make any excess dishivite or excess MGL uh, that we can see. Right? Mike? What happens when you add iron to the system, or and and or alkalis actually as well? Well, when well the answer is of course I don't know, except that others who have studied previously Bridgman or, or, or water solubility in Bridgmanite, both on Casanova, um, Murakami worked in the iron bearing system, um, but and, and of course there's this big big span of, of different results. And, and so there's no way to unpick from the experiments that we have to date what the effect of iron would be on this. I mean, one thing to think about is that instead of an alumina, alumina substitution, you have alumina iron substitution um, for magnesium and silica. Whether that changes the, the, the hydrogen solubility mechanism, I, I really don't know. Well, it would be. That, that's what I mean. The, the substitution would be Al3 plus Fe3 plus. And whether that energetically provides a more favorable mechanism for hydrogen incorporation through an Mg FeHO3 substitution, um, I'm not sure. So, so, Mike, this has been really fascinating. I'd like to sort of step back and see your thoughts on the kind of question that we were asking two weeks ago in St. Andrews that we know that there is a flux of hydrogen, also of carbon, from the surface environment to the deep interior. We know there are also fluxes from the deep interior 
the surface. But there's no reason in the world why those have to balance. In mm -hmm. fact, you wouldn't think they would. Why do we still have oceans? If there's such huge, and, and you know the, the turnover cycle based on the rate of subduction is just a few hundred million years. Um, there's, a, there's a study by Parai Mupadvehe, they did that for, for water. And they asked that very question. And they used that. In fact, they used the change in, in the ocean volume a, 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 as precisely as we can know that um, through time to make estimates on the amount of, of recycling of water permanently back into the mantle. And they come up with a number that was considerably lower, I think maybe five times lower than, than Peter's for, uh, for subduction into the deep mantle. Was it pretty close? I thought it was, it, it's a bit lower than yours, right? Um, so not a lot. Um, you know, my view of that is in that this makes relatively good sense from the point of view that it's very difficult to have a subduction pathway that doesn't take you into complete dehydration, at least for the basaltic and the sediment portion of the crust. And there's only specific pathways in the interior, and we don't even know how much water is in the interior of a slab. It has to get there by, by fissures. Um, basically, um, how much that, you know, there's only specific ways to get that in. Um, and so water, even more so than carbon, 